Well, hello and welcome. We are at Redlands Community Church Youth Ministry Sunday School, and everybody's, you don't have to be a youth to be here. Everybody's welcome, of course, and we are in the seventh uh, part of our series on threads of inspiration. We're taking a look at different Bible study techniques, some themes in Scripture, some types of Christ that we see in Scripture, different things that we can hopefully get more out of our Bible study with and be more inspired in our life for Christ with. So go ahead and grab your Bibles. They'll open up in prayer, and then we'll start talking about snakes. Yes, snakes. We kind of brought it up last week, so we're going to have to continue it this week. So let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll see what what's up with the snakes. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your great love. We just celebrated Thanksgiving, and we come before you humbly and recognize that you have given us so much, and we respond, Lord, with gratitude. Gratitude for your word, for your son, for your salvation, for your creation. Lord, for the relationships that you give us, help us to live them according to your pattern and according to your plan. Lord, we ask this and we praise you as we look to you for wisdom in this study. In Jesus' name, amen. So what's that about snakes? Well, last week we were talking about uh, our our chiastic structures, right? The chiasmus we find in scriptures, and we wrapped it all up with three long books of John, or the three longest books of, of John's writings, the gospel, the revelation, and the first epistle that John wrote. And in each of those, we saw that in the central theme that here this was Satan, the great serpent, being cast down, and Jesus undoing and destroying the works of the devil. And so we see that the central theme in each of those books is Jesus really taking care of the damage that Satan did. And so this opening slide is from Revelation, and that's the center part of Revelation, the focus part. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And so we're, we're seeing at this point he was thrown out of heaven in the Gospel of John. In the middle of it, he was thrown out of the, the earth into the abyss. And then in the epistle of John, we see that, that Jesus destroyed all of his works. So that brings us to kind of this idea of snakes in the scripture. It all started right back in the Garden of Eden. And we've got this serpent who was the craftiest of all that was deceiving Eve. And so you get this cool little slide from Indiana Jones. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? And if you don't get the reference, ask an old guy. He'll tell you what it is. And if you haven't seen the movie yet, again, you can just ask an old guy. But let's go ahead, grab our Bibles, and turn back to Genesis chapter 3, and we'll see how this all started. And so far, we've got the, the account of creation, and we have the account of Adam and Eve and them walking in the garden in the cool of the day with the Lord, and everything is going really well. And they've been given one command, don't eat from the, the tree in the middle of the garden. And so the serpent comes, that's Satan, the, you know, the devil, is coming, and he's going to deceive because he is a liar and the father of lies. This is what he does. So Genesis 3, 1 through 5 reads, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from, from the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. And so the serpent said to the woman, You will surely not die, for God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so that's kind of where it all gets started. And we can, there's, there's been volumes of commentary written on this passage because this is really where sin and death entered into the world. And we see Satan twisting God's word. We even see, see Eve twisting God's word that uh, they weren't commanded not to touch it. They're just committed not to eat from it. But here she is adding to the law that God had given. That's a problem. And that's something that we might look at later on. What happens when we add to God's laws, when we make our own rules, when we add rules upon rules? That's something to be very 
very weary or leery of when we see that sort of thing happening in our own lives and around us because that's something that we see as part of the deceit in the garden. But so here we have the introduction to snakes and this one um, is Satan and he's being presented as a snake in this passage. And so when we come to the results of what happened here, God has to deal with Adam and then he has to deal with Eve and then he deals with Satan here. And he says to the servant, because you have done this further down in chapter three, cursed are you above all the cattle and more than any beast of the field on your belly, you will go and in dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your heel and you shall crush or he will crush your head though you bruise his heel. So the seed of the woman will crush the head of the the snake, even though the snake bruises his heel. And so the seed of the woman, of course, this is the first promise of Jesus Christ, the first promise of the Savior, the Messiah, who would be to come to undo the works of the devil. So as we continue on, you can find a number of places, it, pretty much anywhere you look and you find serpent or viper or snake or cobra, anything like that in the scriptures, you're going to find that something bad is being spoken of. That if someone is called a snake or a viper, it's just like today, that that's a bad thing. And I know there are people that like snakes, but the scripture doesn't speak highly of them at all and uses snakes as, as a metaphor for all kinds of evil. And well, here's an example. It, with the, uh, the tribes of Israel, in the, Dan will judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel, and Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a horned snake in the path that bites the horse's heels so that the rider falls backwards. For your salvation I wait, O Lord. Okay. Also, we know that Moses' staff was turned into a snake to show God's power, right? And he demonstrated that to Moses at the burning bush. And then, of course, Moses demonstrated that to Pharaoh. And, and Aaron demonstrated that to Pharaoh. And so we had these, uh, the, the picture of these snakes demonstrating God's great power. And yet there was this, this threat to them. And, and when Moses first sees it, he runs away from it. He flees from his staff that had become a snake. And God tells him to pick it up by the tail. Now think about that. If you're going to grab a snake, where do you grab it? Right behind the head, right? So that it can't turn around and bite you. So Moses in faith has to reach down and grab that snake's tail. And of course, it turns back into a staff. But anywhere you look in the scripture, in many, many passages, and we just don't have time to go over all of them today, you're going to see that, that snake equals bad. And that's good enough to say from there. But then there's something else that goes on with Moses in the desert with snakes that's a fascinating one. Go to Numbers chapter 21 and we'll read a portion of that together. So the people of Israel, they set out from Mount Hor and the people became impatient. They didn't like the food that they were eating. They didn't, they, they spoke out to Moses. They cried out. They were whining to God and they said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness. So basically what they're saying is we'd rather be slaves than be free out here in the wilderness. We'd rather have the food of Egypt and, and a whip at our backs than be out here and be free. And so they're, they're crying out that, man, this is, this is worse than it was in slavery. It's amazing. People think this way, but sometimes they do. So they ask Moses, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food or water. and We loathe this miserable food. Here they're saying there's no food, and then they're saying they hate the food that they have. Interesting. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of them died. So the people came to Moses and said, okay, we get it. We've sinned. We've spoken out against the Lord. We've spoken out against you. Please intercede to the Lord for us that he may remove these serpents, these snakes from us. So here's a passage where these snakes are being given as a a punishment for the sin of turning against the Lord, not not cherishing and not living in faith with the things that he had given them. And so the passage continues. And so Moses did intercede for the people. The Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent. By the way, when it says fiery serpent, that can mean that it's, it's bite, felt like fire. That can mean that it was orange in color. That can mean a lot of things. This Don't get in your head that there's these, you know, um, 
serpents on fire, flaming serpents cruising around. I, I don't think that that's what that adjective is going for there. But make a fiery serpent, set it on a standard, and it shall come about that everyone, when he is bitten, when he looks at that, he will live. And so Moses made a bronze serpent and he set it on a standard and it came about that if a serpent bit anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Okay, so he would look and that was kind of the idea of repenting, that he would recognize that God is, is there. And that was, that was great time of deliverance. And really they were, they were grumbling against the Lord because they wanted to rather follow the the slave masters in Egypt. So they're wanting to follow someone other than the Lord. This is called idolatry. And interestingly enough, this bronze serpent became an idol for many of the Israelites so that Hezekiah had to destroy it. And so Hezekiah, when he became king in 2 Kings chapter 18, he did right in the sight of the Lord. And he he destroyed all of the high places in the Asherah poles, and he even had to break into pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the sons of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan, or Nehushtan, or you can figure out how to, Nehushtan, Nehushtan. Yeah, you can figure out how to pronounce that. Anyway, so they started worshiping this thing. So again, you've got this, this whole idea of snakes being bad. And but God using this to deliver the people from the snakes. Now, why would God use a picture of a snake on a pole to deliver the people in Israel from the plague of snakes that they brought upon themselves because of their grumbling and their wanting to follow someone other than God? Why would he do that? It seems kind of strange, right? But remember, we've been looking at these patterns and these themes that flow through Scripture so that we would not have any excuses when we see the Messiah to recognize that it truly is Him. And so Jesus, when He's speaking with Nicodemus, He tells him, you must be born again. And Nicodemus is not getting it. And He says to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answers him, He says, are you the teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things, you should have because you should have been reading your scriptures. You, I know you know the scriptures, but think them through. They're deeper than you realize. Truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus says, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Oh, okay, now we've got a picture here. So why, why was the snake put up on the pole in the desert? Jesus is saying so that that could be a picture of the Messiah. Oh, wait a minute. The, the snake is the representation of things that are bad, right? The things that are sinful, the, the things that are false or, or lying, the, you know, the devil himself even. So why would Jesus then represent, be represented by a snake? Well, remember, it was he who became sin, who knew no sin. He became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. And so the picture of the snake on the, on the post hanging up there, being lifted up, is the picture of Christ taking our sins upon himself as he hung upon the cross. That whoever looks upon that cross and understands that sacrifice that Jesus made, then we will be raised also with him to eternal life. And so Jesus destroys the work of Satan in that he was hung on the tree and lifted up just as the snake in the wilderness was lifted up that anyone who looked upon it would live. We who look upon our Lord Jesus Christ, then we shall live as well. And so we finish up with this in inspiring verse from Isaiah. A shoot will spring up from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. So we're talking about the Messiah. The nursing child will play 
by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover over the sea, from Isaiah chapter 11. So why did it have to be snakes? Because they represent the bad that Jesus took upon himself and they represent the lifting up that Jesus allowed to be done to him that we might have eternal life who look upon him and believe and trust that the curse be lifted, that the, the works of the devil be destroyed to the point where snakes are no longer a bad thing. The children can even play with them. That's our God. That's the one who saves. That's the one who is willing to lift himself up that we might be lifted up with him. Praise him this week. Take a look at those scriptures. See what you think and have a great week. God bless you.